Hi again, everyone. If you were here for the beginning of today, you'll remember me. But for those who tuned in later, I'm Lori Jennings, Deputy Editor of Good Housekeeping and Director of the Good Housekeeping Institute. Before we jump into our next session and discussion, which I think is going to be very impactful, I just want to say a quick thank you to Birner and the great presentation she did of our Good Housekeeping Sustainable Innovation Award winners and also offer my congrats to all of the winners. Amazing work and great job. Please keep it up. So now it's my honor to be here with Dr. Wallace J. Nichols. Dr. J is an accomplished marine biologist. He's a self-described turtle nerd, dad, well, not self-described dad, he is a dad. He's an <laughs> author of Blue Mind. Last year, Dr. J delivered the opening keynote at Raise the Green Bar. And I recall just being so moved and inspired by his simple message around the healing and creative benefits of being near water. We invited him back because I think he's experienced some things lately that really demonstrate the devastating effects of climate change and how that can really impact people personally. So before we go any deeper, I think, well, first, welcome, Dr. Jay. Thanks so much for joining us. But also, I'd like to play a video of Jay's home. Don't fall asleep. Don't let me close my eyes. I don't want to wake up to the other side. Well, I'm finally finding peace and peace. But little is such a beautiful space and you know when we look at that video it just like such looks like such an inviting and wonderful place to be now i have the role of explaining that you know you and your family experienced a real tragedy in that space or with that space fairly recently uh can you can you tell us about that can you tell us about what happened and yeah um well thank you for having me come back and chat uh, love you guys. Love see you, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Love love this conversation and um, really, um, I that was a good home to put it really clearly and appropriately for this conversation. We endeavored to make a good home. We this summer experienced uh, an, an incredible storm. Um, I've never seen anything like it in California. Uh, 12,000 dry lightning strikes hit land and started 600 wildfires. And one of the biggest fires, um, our house, our home was one of the first to, to be burned down. Um, and uh, I evacuated on uh, the night that it burned um, in time and got the dog and I mean, our family is safe and healthy, um, but we lost everything. And really, I, I grabbed a Bluetooth speaker and a duffel bag with some clothes and a uh, a quart of oat milk, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Now, looking back on it, I didn't really have my head together, but um, got out in time, did not endeavor to fight the fire. Fortunately, I had, there would have been no chance. And um, it came ro literally roaring up the canyon. It probably burned our house like a marshmallow on a stick, really. I think it must have been fast and hot. And um, going back there was, you know, was devastating. Uh, there's all that was standing is uh, the fireplace, literally. And everything else was mangled, burned, ashes, metal. Even our vintage Airstream trailer melted. So... Um, Aluminum melts at 1,221 degrees, to put it in perspective. So that canyon was just a 
in Inferno. Uh, we're just one of many families that lost their homes. Uh, the fires have taken over 4 million acres right now as we speak. Um, and, you know, this is unprecedented. This is the being called the worst natural disaster in U.S. history. Um, certainly the biggest fire season we've seen in California. Um, so countless, you know, fa families, communities are dealing with it right now, figuring out what to do about it, and then rebuilding in some hopefully more sustainable way. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's the story there. We, we loved our home. We shared it widely. Thousands of people have spent time there. The doors were never locked, literally. <laughs> uh, I didn't know where the keys were. I don't think I'll find them. <laughs> <at this point. laughs> Probably, right. Um, I remember when I first, you know, saw the photo on Instagram, I didn't realize immediately what I was looking at, which again, we'll put the photo up on the screen so everyone can see it. But, you know, at first I thought I was looking at just a beautiful ethereal photo and it took me some time to understand what had actually transpired there. And I know that this, this place was so special and really sacred to your family I mean, can you give us some of the history? I know, you know, you've come to us last year and, and we know you through Blue Mind, but Slow Coast is also something that is part of your philosophy and part of your work that you do. And, and it feels like this home was so the core of that. So can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, what this home and what Slow Coast signifies to you and, and what it means for your life and your philosophy? Yeah, so Slow Coast is the name of the 50-mile stretch of coast where we live that we, we coined the name and it stuck. Um, and it just means that it's a place, you know, there's no fast food, there's, there's no Starbucks, there's barely a gas station, uh, there's no cell service. Uh, and ironically, it's just over the mountains from Silicon Valley, which you could call Fast Valley, maybe mm -hmm. the fastest valley on the planet. Um, it's the biggest economic engine uh, the world has ever seen, Silicon Valley. You go over the mountains and you're on the slow coast and all of a sudden you can't even get a, a cell signal uh, or a cup of Starbucks. So it's, it's really the 180 degree opposite of, of Fast Valley. And it's a place of incredible biodiversity, redwoods, a beautiful coastline, great surf, great hiking. Um, wonderful wildlife and organic farms. And it, you know, I think it, in a lot of ways it embodies the ideals of sustainability. And so this philosophy of slowing down and reconnecting to yourself, to the place, supporting local artisans and farmers is really what, what we're all about. And our home was created with that in mind. Uh, we use a lot of upcycled wood, um, old, old growth Douglas fir that was recovered from old buildings and bridges that were torn down. Um, every decision from the door, doorknobs to the light switches was mindful and careful. And you know, we, we didn't have doorknobs until we found the right ones. Um, the rugs were my grandmother's and she got them when she was young, traveling in, in, uh, Iran and Iraq. Um, so, you know, everything was very intentional and very done very slowly. To lose it was, you know, more than just stuff, you know, more than just a house. It was, as you say, kind of the, the, the headquarters in a way of the slow coast idea. Strangely, poetically, in a way, I'd say beautiful. Uh, the storm that created the lightning, that created the fire, was a beautiful storm. Um, fire itself is a, a natural phenomenon that ecosystems use to, but they need it, in fact. You know, the pines and the manzanita, the redwoods are, are largely fireproof. And when you look at the photos of the burned down house, you see it's surrounded by some very, very stressed out redwood trees whose leaves are brown. And I can say now, a month and a half later, 
there are green sprouts starting to show up around those trees and on those trees. Um, most of them will survive and be here in a thousand years uh, or be there in a thousand years. So that you say you, you saw the photo and it was beautiful and it is. And the reason it's beautiful is that, you know, that, that stone architectural structure of a fireplace surrounded by these majestic redwood trees. Um, and it is, it is spooky and beautiful. Uh, to be in a, a, a post-fire forest, redwood forest. That's what the slow coast is about. It's about that pace, you know, the redwoods pace, the ocean's pace of life. I mean, I have to say I'm, I'm really amazed by your resilience and from what I've seen from the, you know, from the outside looking in since I first saw the photo that, you know, really inspired us to bring you back here this year. We don't usually have somebody come back a second year in a row, but we really felt like we needed, we needed to connect and we needed to, you know, you're part of the good housekeeping, the made safe, the raise the green bar family. And we needed to hear from somebody, you know, who's been, first of all, such an advocate for oceans and turtle health and sustainability and nature to be impacted by this, you know, and the, and the, personal feeling that comes with that i mean how how are you doing like honestly how are you doing <laughs> not good i so i appreciate what hearing from you saying you know telling me i'm strong and resilient and i have to honestly say um i don't believe you i don't feel <laughs> that way but i but hearing it helps uh remind me that okay you know, that's a perception. I must be doing something right. Um, but, you know, being completely transparent, uh, it's terrible. Um, I feel, you know, burnt out by everything. You know, the pandemic, our election, uh, the economy, the conflict and um, social justice fights that we have around us um climate change and then oh my home burned um, what was it like when you walked back up to that space i mean how did you feel when you saw the devastation i can i can hardly describe it but I, my our younger daughter julia came with me and we had to hike about a mile to get there because there were trees down and things were still burning but i needed I wasn't supposed to be there legally or officially, but I needed to see what was left, if anything. And uh, coming around, you know, it's down a dirt road up a canyon. And coming around and just, you know, seeing um, a, your home that you, it's so familiar. Every, every stone that was still standing was familiar and at the same time completely weird and um, grotesque in a way and so there's this intimacy familiarity of every nail and every screw and every piece of what remained because we built it with our hands every stone yet so strange so scrambled um, like a fire blender scramble. And that is hard for your brain to deal with, to the familiarity and intimacy combined with the strangeness of it. And um, we helped some lost reporters. We were going out there and there were some reporters who were lost and I think dangerously lost and without water. And they followed us. And I remember one of them asked Julia, um, where was your bedroom? And she looked up and pointed uh, to the air where her bedroom had been up in the air overlooking the creek in the redwoods. That moment summarized it. She, uh, she has the spatial awareness to say that my bedroom was up there in a space that is now just air. Um, that's how strange it was. It was like that's she lived suspended in the air on some boards in a room, her bedroom, in a bunk bed. 
but that was all gone. So it was just, she pointed to the sky basically. Um, just very, very surreal, I guess. The word surreal makes way more sense to me. You know, your book is Blue Mind and it's really about the healing power of water. How were you able to apply those principles in that moment? I got in the creek. I literally stripped down and got to the deep spot of Mill Creek, which is was the source of all of our water and much of our joy. Uh, I just got in the water. And it was cold, a very cold, icy creek in a little deep hole in the creek. And just got in there with, with the crawdads and the, you know, and just sat in there naked, you know, and felt like, wow, I, this is what I need. This is my medicine. Um, and then in that moment, all the cliches come to mind, you know, all the things you've heard throughout your life in times of grief and loss and tragedy, all the cliches, they all make sense. Um, they're cliches for a reason. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought to myself, wow, you know, I've heard of this thing, Zen. Have you ever heard of Zen? It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty, it's really useful, it turns out. Um, it's not an app. It's not a book. It's a, it's a way of being in the moment. Uh, and I, I'm joking about it, but any your spiritual practice, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, these philosophies that become cliche, they make sense. Um, and uh, that's all you can do, really, is get in your water and breathe and and then work, you know, I just went right back to work on the things I love and care about. Um, I have friends, I have community, people like you and made safe and good housekeeping friends that I know are there and um, have, you know, offered to come and put a hammer in their hand and start rebuilding. And when the time comes, that's gonna be a good party. Uh, <laughs> that helps, it helps really. Uh, and so there's, you know, incredible sadness every time I think of something that I want to put my hands on, a photograph that only existed in analog, you know, paper form, um, you know, surfboard, I mean, whatever burn, and it's, it's gone. Uh, you just got to push through it. And it's just stuff, they say, but it's uh, the material um underpinning of, of our lives you know the baseball cards from my dad's childhood you know i think about all the work you do so much so much of it in sustainability and you know a lot of experts and scientists and you know people who have a lot of knowledge on these things are saying a lot of these fires are the result of you know unchecked climate change and preventable and all of these things. I know you mentioned it was a natural disaster, but natural disasters are more common and bigger and just seem to be more and there just seems to be more and more of it. And, you know, what's your response to that? And what's your perspective on that? Having been so personally impacted by potentially something that is the result of all the, uh, you know, of, of the work that you fight against in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I can look back to my college years. I graduated from college in 1989. I remember reading Bill McKibben's book, The End of Nature. And back then, you know, that's that's a while back. You know, we're looking at 30-something years ago. Um, we would say things like, by 2020, this could happen if we don't fill in the blank whether it was plastic pollution or climate change or uh, endangered species or habitat loss, it's 2020 and here we are. And, and it's happening. The, and it's happening. So this is not a, by, if you hear somebody say by 2050, X, Y, Z will happen, just tell them to be quiet. And let's, this is not, we can't kick the can down the road anymore. This is now. Climate change isn't a forecast. Plastic pollution is not a forecast. It is reality. So we need to respond to that reality and make changes. But we also need to be resilient and keep our heads together. And I can say that from a place of feeling like I'm not doing a good job at that part. 
you you can't be part of the creative collaborative team of people making making things new the, the new way of doing things if you can't keep your head together running around like a chicken with your head cut off in red mind mode or burning out in gray mind mode is not what we need we need people who are calm cool collective creative and collaborative to work together on the solutions and we know what the solutions are that's the good news um and a young voice can be in an 80 year old body a young voice can be in a 15 year old body but we need big bold youthful ideas that work and so it's never been more clear to me um and that's that's where i find my optimism is that we do have the answers uh on the shelf and we have the answers from uh, from the neuropsychologists from the technologists from the people who make things um from a, a policy point of view uh so we're we're ready to make a cleaner, safer, more just world. Um, we've got it all available. We just need to kick a few people out of the way <laughs> or, or escort them. I don't want to get violent here. I'm not a violent person. I don't think, I'm not going to kick anybody. I will, you know, show, let's show them the door um, politely and, um, you know, let's get this, let's get, get this done. But, you know, we've been talking about climate change for decades we've been talking about plastic pollution for decades um the science on both dates back to the 70s the 70s remember the 70s like we've had the science decided science for 40 plus years right. um going on 50 years to say we need more research no we're going to do more research we will always do research we don't need more research to solve problems to take these things seriously and just move us to a more sustainable place, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of our material world, but also our our um, our mental or emotional world. Uh, we're not in a sustainable place emotionally, ecologically, nor economically right now. Uh, but we know how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, if of course we're always running against the clock in these events <laughs> but um if you had just one sort of rallying cry or one you know message that you want to get out there of things that people can start tomorrow or do tomorrow or you know sure we're talking about 2050 and 30 years ago we were talking about in 2020 but what about tomorrow what would you want people to take away for tomorrow yeah i'm not even going to wait till tomorrow let's talk about today here's what okay, here's sure. what i want you to do okay. today <laughs> Let's not waste any time. Um, practice Blue Mind today. If you're listening to this, practice Blue Mind today. And what I mean by that is figure out what's your water. Is it a bathtub? Is it a river down the road? Is it a pond, a lake, an ocean? Maybe your water is music. Maybe your water is a digital recording of your favorite water sound. Maybe it's a piece of artwork or photography. Um, so your water may be virtual, it may be wild, it may be domestic, it could be the water in your home, maybe urban, it could be a fountain down the street. If you're in New York City, go sit by a fountain, but do it today. Pre keep your head together. Uh, get, stay away from all that red mind. Definitely speaking from the heart of experience right now, don't burn out. It's no, it's no good, it's terrible. You don't let yourself burn out. Practice blue mind. And that is the basis of real sustainability. You, you can't have a sustainable family, household, organization, community, or nation from emotional unwellness from that perspective. But take good care of your mind. Take good care of your emotional health. And then the other parts will follow that was the same message i shared last year so <laughs> i was getting out know, repetition is is useful uh, so <laughs> I mean, i'll say it, it again it is an evergreen message absolutely uh and i just want to thank you so much for joining us today i'm so 
thankful that you and your family are safe. I know you have a journey ahead of you. We are there along the way with you wherever we can help. The organizers of the conference today are going to be making a donation to your um, to your site so that we can help contribute financially as well. But we will also be there with hammers and nails if needed. And we just want to thank you again for joining us. It was great to see your face. It was great to hear uh, everything you had to share. And I, I really do hope we can not deal in 2050 what we are dealing with in 2020. Right. Thank you. This conversation with you is medicine for me. So thank you. Thank you.